What is hardened JavaScript? In short, JavaScript provides a highly malleable scripting environment suitable for running programs written by strangers on behalf of a user with limited access to the user's resources. If that program chooses to sacrifice some of that malleability, they gain in exchange the ability to safely invite other programs to interact with them directly at the boundary between individual objects. That is hardened JavaScript. Software has a long tradition of increasing interactivity by sending programs from servers to clients. From the VT100 terminal to the web browser and even arguably the pattern of installing any networked software all increase interactivity. They increase interactivity by eliminating expensive round trips between the user and the service. They risk increasing vulnerability because the user must be able to run arbitrary programs from strangers on the internet. More so if said programs are in a Turing complete language. We aim to create interactive software while avoiding vulnerability. To have interactivity, we need to be able to run other people's programs, but running other people's programs is dangerous and some people will even tell you that you shouldn't. But I'm here to tell you that you can run other people's programs safely. The solution is hardened JavaScript. In the Odyssey, Odysseus encounters the sirens, dangerous creatures who lure sailors with their song, only to dash their ships against the rocky shore. Odysseus commands his crew to stuff their ears and bind him to the mast of his galley, intent upon hearing the song, but not suffering the consequences, so he could interact without vulnerability. This was, of course, a classical metaphor for running strangers' programs off the internet. The Siren's song is akin to a program that you would very much like to run, with the ability to delight your senses and intellect, but without direct access to your motor functions. But why JavaScript? It is no accident that we rely on JavaScript to run arbitrary programs off the internet. The language is designed to run in a sandbox. Web browsers are user agents. They mediate interaction between the programs provided by strangers and their access to the user's resources. JavaScript mitigates vulnerability when there are only two parties, the stranger and the user. This interaction model works with a sandbox because the stranger's program is welcome to the ruin the sandbox for itself and cannot wreak havoc beyond the boundary that exists between the user agent and the isolated program. However, the notion that there are only two parties involved in a web page is a rapidly deteriorating fiction. Every end of a modern web application, even a centralized monolith, mixes the conflicting motivations of myriad agents, the user, the service, their advertisements, their vendors, and their attackers. And while we might find some comfort in the security boundaries at our firewalls or authenticated asynchronous communication over encrypted connections, those boundaries will not protect us from the dependencies we entrain from our favorite package management system. When there are three or more parties interacting in a sandbox, a sandbox is not sufficient. When one stranger can pollute the environment, the other stranger becomes vulnerable, and the strangers can attack, attack each other directly at the user's expense. For three or more parties to interact, we need a solid foundation, not a box of sand. And in a world where we can safely create interaction involving any number of strangers, new categories of software become possible. Though JavaScript was not originally intended to sandbox multiple potentially adversarial programs simultaneously, it has always had some convenient properties. And about 10 years ago, it gained the last remaining properties necessary to safely evaluate stranger's code without expensive static analysis or rewriting. A JavaScript program can't wander around in memory looking for pointers to powerful objects, and it can't invoke a kernel function without calling a host function. That means the program can be denied host functions outright and can be delegated specific and revocable pointers to objects we wish it to be able to use. 
a JavaScript function can hold powerful can hold a powerful object in local scope and use it on behalf of its callers without sharing all of that power. The run to completion event loop model, as opposed to shared memory concurrency like threads, for one avoids the hazard of deadlock, which threatens liveliness, and also gives programs the ability to ensure that some functions can be called in separate events, avoiding reentrance hazards. JavaScript was not born suitable for co-tenant programs, but strict mode eliminates the most pernicious misfeatures like the arguments object or with blocks. And with strict mode, JavaScript gained the ability to harden objects, making them irrevocably tamper-proof. Imagine you serve data and want to allow clients to be able to make arbitrary queries on that data without transmitting all of the data. You arrange for a client to send a program to the data, instead of the data to the program. We typically use hobbled programming languages for this kind of interaction, to avoid making the service vulnerable to these programs. In JavaScript, you might naively evaluate an arbitrary JavaScript query, but with the soft and malleable version of the JavaScript language, the query receives far too much power. It can read database from scope. It can call any method of any object in scope. It can modify any mutable variable in scope. It can install a thunk on the prototype of a popular method. It can add a proxy to the prototype of the global object. It can load your powerful networking module and exfiltrate your secret burger sauce recipe. In JavaScript, you run other people's programs using an evaluator. Contrary to popular wisdom, eval is not evil, and I can prove it. The Levenstein distance between eval and evil is not zero, even if you give it a discount for vowel substitution. But, like evil, eval comes in many forms. The oldest and most perilous form is direct eval, where the program you run inherits the caller's scope. This is the so-called dynamic scoping eval, and it can do arcane things, like introduce variables to the caller's scope. This eval would happily allow the sirens to overshadow undefined in the scope of the caller. The lesser eval is indirect eval. Indirect eval is a minor reformation of the direct eval that reparents the program in global scope. Although the only way to invoke a direct eval is to call a function literally named eval, it also happens to be bound to the original eval function in global scope. Indirect eval works by calling the original global eval function any other way. In these two cases, we're running the siren song to make the perfectly valid statement like 2 plus 2 is math, or array is object. The subtle eval is the function constructor, which compiles a program and runs it in a closure scope parented on global scope. In this case, the siren song sets nan to a very special number, just like real nans. Eval can be subverted in many ways mostly by exploiting the pervasive mutability of the JavaScript environment. The web has benefited tremendously from the pervasive mutability that it gives programs. It is this malleability that has allowed JavaScript to grow as a language. Notably, shims are programs that anticipate new features and patch them into global scope. Now, we can turn that pervasive mutability in upon itself, taming, hardening the runtime environment, making it suitable for multi-tenant programs. Hardened JavaScript, like Gaul before it, is divided into three parts. Lockdown, Harden, and Compartment. Lockdown prepares, Harden defends, and Compartments isolate. With these three devices, programs are not automatically safe, but have ground to stand on to defend their own design. Lockdown prepares the shared JavaScript primordial objects like array, the object constructors, and prototypes, fixes some features that would allow programs to watch or interfere with one another, removes unrecognized methods from these objects just in case, and then freezes all of those objects. Some of those objects are subtle, like the prototypes for various iterators, or the async function prototype, which any program can find, but not just by visiting the properties of the global object. The harden function freezes an object in its transitive properties, rendering it 
its prototype, and everything reachable from its surface tamper-proof. Lockdown reveals the hardened function so that programs can safely share their interfaces with strangers. Lockdown also prepares a compartment constructor that can run arbitrary programs in an environment that has a unique global this, eval, function, and compartment constructors that can evaluate programs with only the capabilities they have been explicitly granted. The host environment still has access to lots of powerful objects, maybe even powerful modules, and can delegate these powers to child compartments. Within a compartment, prototype pollution attacks through the shared intrinsics are not possible, and the harden function is available for programs to prevent prototype pollution on their own objects. You can't subvert the definition of NAN, you can't redefine math, you can't munge the shared prototypes, you can only get what your host gave you. So, returning to our concrete example, we can provide a search feature that can run arbitrary queries. The application arranges to call lockdown once, as early as possible in the program's life, because lockdown itself is vulnerable to all code that runs before it. The application then arranges for a compartment in which to run queries. Because this compartment is shared by multiple parties and contains no modules, we then freeze the compartment's global. Then because we want to be able to inject individual items into the scope of the query, we capture a copy of the safe function constructor from within the compartment and use that to compile queries. In addition, we use Harden to make the search function and arrays it returns tamper-proof. With this arrangement, queries cannot attack the database directly because they do not have access to the database object. They also cannot stage a man-in-the-middle attack or exploit re-entrance by polluting the shared array prototype. And they can't reach the file system, much less grief it or worse, they do not have access to the powerful modules or other forms of what we call ambient authority, powerful objects laying around for any part of your program to use. The most common approach to creating sandboxes relies on a coarser boundary called a realm, like a same origin iframe or what Node.js and V8 call a VM context. With these approaches, each tenant program gets their own unique set of primordials, like their own array constructor. The approach is fraught with a number of inconveniences, but most notably, identity discontinuity. The array from one realm is chemically incompatible with the array from another. And ultimately, while separate realms can defend explicitly partitioned programs, you may find that the enemy is already within the gate. All modern software runs in a crowded house, regardless of whether they can do so safely. All programs are vulnerable to their dependencies, their so-called software supply chain. A modern JavaScript program consists of maybe 3% novel code and 97% dependencies that must be kept up to date, all of which have an opportunity to interfere with the developer's plans. And in nearly every programming language, especially pliable JavaScript, these dependencies run with all the same power as the 3% that orchestrates the whole. And if that does not give you pause, consider that engines like Node.js implement most of their powerful APIs in the same realm as the programs that they run. Our partners at MetaMask built a tool called LavaMoat on top of hardened JavaScript that allows them to limit the attack surface they expose to third-party dependencies all the way from their front end to the build tooling during development. Together, we are building a tool called Endo that demonstrates how hardened JavaScript, including its asynchronous compartment-based module system, can be used to host many applications designed without foreknowledge of hardened JavaScript. We at Agoric and members of the CES community are pursuing standardization of hardened JavaScript, but you need not wait. We have built a shim that implements lockdown, harden, and compartment, with very high fidelity, and if you are targeting embedded systems, particularly, Modable's XS JavaScript engine implements these features natively. For Agoric, hardened JavaScript is the foundation that allows us to safely and deterministically run smart contracts. To us, 
hardened JavaScript is part of a decentralized operating system, where we use promises as proxies for remote objects, eschewing heavy RPC frameworks in favor of asynchronous message passing between hardened objects, where we can arrive at consensus through a replicated log of these messages and deterministic JavaScript replay. With Modable's XS JavaScript engine, we can even snapshot running programs and resume them later, not even necessarily on the same host. But why harden JavaScript? Allow me to digress into my own motivation for contributing to this project. I like exciting projects. To me, an exciting project has three noteworthy traits. First, it is evident that if the project succeeds, almost everything naturally comes to depend on it and the new world is bigger, more cooperative, safer, or accessible than the old one. The project would cause a Cambrian explosion of diversity and activity. Second, nobody wants it. Most people will simply not know about it. It's not on their radar. Some people will know about it and dismiss it as unlikely to gain traction. Some people will resist it because it's inconvenient, since it will require rethinking or retooling, all of which are fair. And third, if you work on the project a little every day, it gradually makes its way up to some invisible watershed and shifts from being radical to inevitable. By way of example, if I may digress further into the dangerous territory of conceit, I've enjoyed some exciting projects. In 2006, JavaScript didn't have a module system. I started promoting a prototype and an informal standard in 2008. People at that time would say, JavaScript doesn't need a module system. Manually topo sorting script tags has always worked, and it always will. And manually sorting script tags was adequate for all of the software made at that time, in no small part, because it was the only kind of software you could make. But it's not obvious on the near side of a hill what lays on the far. In 2010, I worked with a new group called CommonJS, and we agreed on a standard for sharing modules that transcended the walled gardens of the warring toolkits of the time. Then, Node.js picked it up to bootstrap its own ecosystem, and now we write a lot more kinds of software than we did with hand-sorted script tags. But if getting the JavaScript community to share modules was a pitched battle with long odds, even though modules were a solved problem in most languages, and nearly everyone knew what they were and how they were supposed to work, you can only imagine how exciting it was to be working to make promises palatable to JavaScript developers. Of course, I've poured my soul into hundreds of projects that never saw the light of day. But, based on my experience with JavaScript modules and promises, I think you're likely to hear about hardened JavaScript again. The purpose of hardened JavaScript is to realize this Cambrian increase in software diversity by allowing a greater degree of cooperation between programs. So please, sail forth from here, listen to the siren song, and live to tell the tale. I'm Chris Kowal, an engineer with the good fortune of working with the incredible team at Agoric, and you can find the hardened JavaScript shim in the Endo project repository on GitHub, or by simply installing CES.